about 25 years ago, or a little over 25 years ago, identified the problem. When I was an undergraduate at the University of Washington, when I graduated in physics, I had a pretty good uh, intuitive understanding of most of the common physical phenomena except lift on a wing. It didn't make sense to me that a wing slices through the air like a thin knife, makes a small transient ripple in the air, and holds up a 250-ton airplane. I worked the problems, I aced the tests, I talked the talk, but it didn't make sense to me. So for the next two decades, I worried about this. And it's not that it's so difficult, it's just that there's so much mythology out there. There's stuff that's just plain wrong. The material that we were all taught and many of you are teaching now is just wrong. Okay. So then I uh, um, finally figured it out. And six years ago, I had this naive thought that aeronautical engineers must understand how wings fly. Turns out some do, most don't, but they can calculate everything. So six years ago, I, uh, I found an aeronautical engineer at the University of Washington, a fellow named Scott Eberhardt, who turned out to be a real gold mine, a very unusual fellow. He wanted to be a high-energy physicist before he was turned into engineering, and he's a pilot, and so he actually worried about how planes fly. He came out six years ago, gave a colloquium here, and during that colloquium he said, that the lift on a wing is directly proportional to the amount of air diverted from the horizontal to the vertical, which is not what you're taught in uh, your courses. So after that, I continued to work on understanding flight. I now knew how a wing flew. Other people have understood this, but nobody has carried it on to say, okay, now that I know that a wing diverts air down from on top, not on below, it's just Newton's laws. What can I, where can I go from that? And I started to derive the basic, uh, the fundamental uh, relationships in aeronautics, but from first principles, not handed down from above as they are in uh, aeronautics textbooks. During this time, I would communicate with Scott Eberhardt, who would say, yes, lift, uh, power, induced power does go as a load square, or induced power goes as one over speed, etc. So he would confirm what I was doing until finally he understood that now he was understanding things intuitively that before he could only explain mathematically. At that point, he really got on board. And two years ago, we wrote a, an article for uh, Sport Aviation, which is st still has a life of its own. We wrote a book entitled Understanding Flight, which was published by McGraw-Hill in December. And uh, so that's, that's the paper. This is the talk. There are, for the sake of argument, I'm going to say there are three descriptions of lift. There's the popular description of lift, which we've all been taught, I believe, and many of us still teach. It fixates on the shape of the wing. The wing is asymmetric. It has a hump on the top, and that's what determines the lift on a wing. We were taught. The cause of lift, we're, we're, we tell each other, is the acceleration of the air over the top of the wing. And now, looking back, it kind of surprises me that no, no bright student ever said, wait, doesn't it take a force to accelerate air? I mean, how can you start there? Air is accelerated by a difference in pressure. So that must be more fundamental than the acceleration of the air. But we get around that problem by coming up with a non-force way of accelerating the air. And that's basically called the principle of equal transit time. We are told, we tell each other, that the two molecules that separate at the leading edge of the wing must go around the wing and meet at the trailing edge. Never say why. And since the one that knows it has to go farther over the hump has to go faster, so it accelerates, no forces involved, everything's happy. <laughs> now we have Bernoulli's relationship, Bernoulli's equation, which relates the speed of the air to uh, the pressure, which we never really defined for ourselves very well. And therefore, since it goes faster, Bernoulli says the pressure is lower, we have a difference in pressure across the wing, and we have lift. As I'll tell you this, that outside of a pipe, air only has a different static pressure when it's going faster if it's bending, not when it's going straight. You'll understand later. Okay, 
the, the pros is that it's real easy to explain to people and real easy to understand. The disadvantage is most of it is just wrong and it's very misleading. You can tell, a, you know, as they say, you can tell a, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If you really understand, it empowers you. What we teach is not, gives us nothing but confusion. Believe it or not, wings don't look like you think. Since the introduction of the B-24 Liberator in the Second World War, all wings are basically symmetric, and which doesn't fit our description. How does a wing, since the shape of the wing def, you know, gives it lift, how does a wing fly upside down? Turns out any wing can fly upside down just as well. How does, how does a wing adjust for load? When a plane goes into a 2G turn, which is a fairly common turn, the wing is now supporting twice as much weight, but it's not going any faster. How do you explain that with the popular description? Or is it, it lightens up? You know, a 747 takes off for a long flight with 40% of its weight and fuel. How does it adjust for speed? You don't, you don't have to fly at any fixed speed. The next um, description is what the aeronautical engineers use, which I'll call the mathematical aeronautics aerodynamic description of lift. It uses complex mathematics and simulations, and it's the origin of the popular description. What a typical um, simulation for an aeronautical engineer will do is the computer simulates the airflow, it calculates all the velocity, the velocity distribution around the wing, they use Bernoulli, they calculate the pressure, and they have the lift, and they worry about that much of the air, okay? But they don't know why it goes faster. The good, the good guys don't even give you an explanation. There's a classical textbook called um, Introduction to Flight by John uh, Anderson. It's a classic. It's spectacular. He uses the, essentially the Bernoulli explanation, but he says, you know, but he never in the book explains why the air goes faster because it just comes out of the simulation. The advantage is it's a powerful calculational tool. Even though they don't understand how it flies, I do. If I were to have to design a wing, I'd hire an aeronautical engineer. The, the disadvantage is it confuses mathematics with physics, which many physicists do too. Okay. And also, it starts with the acceleration of air as the cause, which is the output from their simulation. It's of no use to the pilot, just as the simulation, I mean, just as the popular description is of no use. The third is the physical description of lift, which you're going to learn here today. It's based primarily on J Newton's three laws, and lift is developed from a wing by diverting air down, but from above. It's pulled down. It's true the air goes faster over the top of the wing, but that's not the cause. It's true there's a lower pressure above the wing. Um, the advantage of this is it gives you an intuitive understanding of flight. Such things is how lift depends on the angle of attack, which is not addressed in the popular description, is, dis is, is clear. Inverted flight will, will be obvious to you. In fact, I'll show you that a barn door, a wing upside down, and a regular wing are all equivalent. Power requirements, something that's not even discussed by the aeronautical engineers, is the key to understanding uh, flight. High speed stalls, for those of you that pi fly, when I flew, we were, we were all taught that you can stall at any speed, and it made no sense to me. Now it's, it's clear. This is useful because unlike the, what the aeronautical engineers do, this has understanding so you know what you're doing, not just by rote memory. A plane does divert air down to develop lift. Here's a picture of a citation that's flown over the fog. This is over Tahoe, Lake Tahoe. That hole is made by the downwash from the, the jet. You can see here the downwash, and you see the wing vortices. We, to some people, it's, it's strange that a wing would blow air down. The wing is supposed to fly by magic. But we all know how a jet and a rocket develop thrust. They blow a lot of gas out, produces thrust in the other direction. A propeller does the same thing. If you stand behind a plane when they start the engines, it blows your hat off. We've all seen pictures of helicopters hovering over the water or over dust. It blows a lot of air down to produce lift. Well, a propeller and the rotor in a helicopter are just rotating wings. For those, oops, 
That was fast. <laughs> For those of you that have never seen propellers, that was a slice that went by. <laughs> I apologize. They're just rotating wings. Now I want you to picture some wings. Picture the wing of a 747. Picture any asymmetric wing flying upside down. Picture a barn door and picture your hand out the window of the car. And if you're really ambitious, throw in a garbage can lid, okay? All of these objects, you can find an angle into the wind where there's zero lift. And we'll call that the effective angle of attack. Now if you measure the lift, both uh, lift as you change the angle, both positive and negative, and were to plot the lift as a function of angle, this is what you would find, that it's a linear function for all of those. The garbage can lid, the 747, your hand out the window, that's what describes lift, not any uh, Bernoullian explanation. You have lift until finally the angle gets so high that the, that the forces become too strong, the air starts to separate from the backside, and you're entering a stall. That's called the critical angle, and the shape, all these wing, air, wings that I've just described will all look different up here, but they'll all look the same down here. Let's see if what we were taught, you know, I, I worked the problems when I was in an undergraduate, and they seemed to uh, support lift. But let's look at a Cessna 172, which is four-seat uh, Cessna. Weighs 2,300 pounds, 174 square feet of wing, slow speed fly to 65 miles an hour. And if you go out and measure the difference in path length over the top and the bottom, they differ by one and a half percent. Pipers tend to be about two and a half percent difference. If you use what we were taught, equal transit time, et cetera, it turns out that that wing produces about 54 pounds of lift, and the minimum speed would be something like 400 miles an hour. It's a real fast Cessna. <laughs> okay? In fact, that's what the wing would have to look like <laughs> for, uh, for uh, the Cessna 172 to fly 65 miles an hour by what we're all taught. Okay? It's a difference in path length of 50%. So what's wrong? Ah, I'm going, I'm going back. Like, first, equal transit time is not true. It's only true for a wing without lift. Um, this, is a, this is a simulation where smoke has been put in. This is a symmetric wing with, with um, lift. And you see that the air that goes over the top actually gets to the trailing edge much sooner than the air that goes under the wing. In fact, the air that goes under the wing is actually retarded with respect to the free stream velocity. So equal transit time never was true. So let's understand lift. First, I'll remind some of you of Newton's three laws that certainly put them in the context of flight. Newton's first law says that a body at rest will remain at rest and a body in motion will continue in straight line motion unless subjected to an external, internally applied force. What this means is if you see an airflow bend, a force has had to be was put on it. Or if you see a clump of air that originally was standing still and later is moving, this was, there was a force acting on this air. Newton's third law, for every action, is the equal and opposite reaction. Push on the, the table, the table pushes back. So what that means is if you see air bend, a, Newton's first law says there's a force put on the air. Newton's third law says there has to be an equal and opposite force put on the object that bent that air. Or, okay. Now Newton's third law, the second law, most of us know it is just F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. A more convenient or applicable form is a, is a, can be applied to the thrust of a rocket or of, of a propeller is that the force is equal to the amount of gas expelled per time times the velocity of that gas, where the amount is, say, kilograms per second and velocity, say, meters per second. So if you know how much gas is coming out of a rocket and you know its velocity, it's trivial to calculate the thrust. Okay. No, after seeing Newton's laws, let's look at a common depiction of airflow around a wing. The air approaches from horizontally, goes around, and comes off horizontally. Nothing was done to that air, so therefore nothing could be done to the wing. There is no lift in this picture. This is what a real 
airflow looks like. But you'll find you know, that previous picture on NASA websites and in Cessna flight manuals. And uh, The air really comes from below the wing, which you'll understand later. It's called upwash. Bends around the wing and comes off at an angle. It comes off with a downward angle. This, this downwash is the action caused by the wing. The fact that the air bent means there's a force on it. And Newton's third law says there has to be an equal and opposite force on the wing. So this, this wing has lift. So why does the air bend around it? When the air were to get to the highest point here, why doesn't it just go straight back? There's an effect that's key that we're not taught in physics, at least I wasn't, called the Quanda effect. It's easy to demonstrate. Run a small flow of water from a faucet and take a glass horizontally and just touch the flow, and you'll see that the water wraps around the glass. That's the same thing that happens to air around the wing. The Newton's first law says that since the water wrapped around the glass, there has to be a force on it. And third law says there has to be equal and opposite force on the glass. So in fact, if you touch the water, the force is to pull the, the glass in, not to push it out like you might think. So why does it do that? Viscosity. Now, a lot of people that know just enough to be dangerous, say, aha, there's where he's wrong. Because in aeronautics, they do their simulations in zero vi with zero viscosity or the limit of zero viscosity. Turns out they add it back in in two places in a sneaky way. The fact that they require the air to flow, to follow the shape of the wing is adding viscosity. And then there's a, a constraint called the Quanda effect that says it has to come off a uh, uniform at the uh, trailing edge. Anyway, what's happening is at the surface, because of viscosity, at the surface, the fluid, which is be it water or be it um, air, has zero velocity. Slightly above it, it has some non-zero velocity, and it keeps growing until it's got the free stream velocity. This is the boundary layer, and it's very thin on a wing. It thickens as, the wing, as it goes back on the wing, and at the trailing edge of a 747, it's still only one inch thick. But because it's absolutely zero at the surface, that's why you can't hose dust off your car. The, the velocity of the water at the surface of the car is zero. Now what's happening is, if you look at two adjacent streamlines, they have different velocities. One's going slower than the other. And because of shear forces, they bend toward the slower one. And that, that causes it to wrap around the object until the forces become too strong. When, again, we look at the airflow, and Newton's first law says that it's the bend requires a force. The direction of the force, the purple force here on the, the bend, the direction of the bend is perpendicular to the bend, and the tightness of the intensity or the strength of the uh, force is proportional to the tightness. The tighter the bend, the greater the force. What you see here is that most of the uh, force is this part of the, the early part of the wing. About one half of the lift of a wing is in the first quarter quarter of the wing. It's because that's where the air bends. But the underside of the wing. Oh, the question was, shouldn't this be true for the underside of the wing? And the answer is yes. But wings really mostly there is a little contribution from above. I mean, from below, and there's a large contribution from above. And yeah, but it's not so much as if you're flying a barn door, it's 50-50 actually. So it's also here shape enters in, in in the contribution. So how does the air pull down? You'll see as much air as it needs to. You'll see it has to be a lot of air. In fact, one thing that used to bother me about the Bernoullian explanation is you have this thin flow of air over the top of low pressure. Why doesn't it collapse? And in fact, it doesn't collapse because it's pulling down lots of air from above. What happens is, well, first you have to, to look at at air at these speeds and pr um, powers as being an incompressible fluid, which seems very, you know, very strange. But you have to remember these are very gentle forces. Even in the Bernoulli description of air flowing through a through a venturi, you you make the assumption it's incompressible. Otherwise, you'd have to correct for change in volume. What happens is, as the air flows over the top and is pulled around by the Quanda effect. The streamline above wants to go straight, but it can't form a void. So what happens is 
the one that's pulled down pulls the one above it down by lowering the pressure. And that pulls the one above it down, and the pressure decreases, but it, pulls, it propagates at about the speed of sound and pulls down lots of air. Now let's start applying um, Newton's second law. The lift on a wing is proportional to the amount of air that's diverted down times the vertical velocity of that air. And I'll explain the vertical velocity in a second. So if you want to increase the lift on a wing, you have two ways of doing it. You can increase the amount of air diverted or inc increase the vertical velocity or product of the two. Now, one of the things that I worried about for a long time was the breakthrough was we're all used to looking at a wing from the rest frame of the pilot or wind tunnel, where the wing is standing still and the air is going by very fast. So you have just a nice, gentle streamline. But in reality, the air is standing still, the wing comes by, and then the air is left doing whatever it's doing. So if you were to stand on a mountain and the wing came by and you could take a picture of the velocity distribution around the wing, what would you see? And the answer is you have the force, which is down, so the thrust has to be up. So it's like you have to aim the rocket down to over, you have to aim the rocket up to, to uh, overcome gravity. So it's going in the right direction. And how can you convince yourself this is true? First, here's an example. Look at it, this helicopter hovering above the water. The pattern on the water is almost the same size as the rotors. Or if you take a small household fan and just feel the column of air as you walk back, it's very tight and straight. Or you've seen pictures of propellers on ships, and it's just a nice tight column coming off. If, if the air in the rest frame of the observer on the ground, if it were coming off the blades at an angle, it would sweep a cone. It's only if it's coming straight down does it form a tight column, which is very nice because that's how a propeller works. If the propeller were producing thrust like this, the tangential component here would just be equal, counteracting the tangential component here. It'd be very inefficient. Or in fact, it produces a tight column. It's, in this case, nature was very good to us. So how do we adjust? What's the relationship between what the person on the mountain sees and the, and the pilot? This is the trailing edge of a wing with some angle of attack. This arrow A is the velocity and direction of the airplane. Arrow B is the velocity and direction as seen by the pilot. And arrow C is the velocity and direction of the air seen by the person on the mountain. This is the vertical velocity that produces the lift. So let's look at this. If I keep the angle of attack the same, but double the speed, you see that doubles the vertical velocity. If I keep the speed the same, go to 1s, but now go to 2 alpha, twice the angle of attack, I double the vertical velocity. So what you see is that the vertical velocity of the air is proportional to the angle of attack and the speed of the wing, nothing else. So what about the air that's, that's being diverted? We know that lift is proportional to the amount of air times the vertical velocity, and the vertical velocity is proportional to the angle of attack and the speed. The amount of air, I want you to look at the, the wing slightly different than you're used to. The air diverts air down in kind of a, it's, a, it's an elliptical shape. I want you to think of it as a scoop that was put on at the factory. It, the area of the scoop is proportional to the area of the wing. Its major axis is proportional to the um, length of the wing, of course. The height is proportional to the cord. A larger a wing with a higher cord, larger cord, will certainly divert much more air down than one with a very narrow cord. The amount of air that the scoop intercepts is proportional to the speed. You go twice as fast, the scoop is, will intercept twice as much air. And it's proportional to the air density. You go to higher altitude, less density, you just divert less mass. That's all. It's not proportional to the load. It's not proportional to the angle of attack. So how much air is accelerated down? Let's take the example of the Cessna 172. We know the force, uh, uh, 2,300 pounds. I've taken a speed of 140 miles an hour. We're going faster now. An angle of attack of 5 degrees, so I can calculate the the vertical velocity. I take the half of that for the average, and it turns out the airplane is diverting about five tons per second. It's diverting five times its own weight per second to hold itself up. It's not a thin you know, surface effect like we, the idea we get from the, what we're taught. 
In fact, this weekend, we did the calculation for a 250-ton airplane at 35,000 feet, and it's diverting about its own weight per second to, to keep in the air. It's a lot of air. Next question is, how much air is that? Just for simplicity, I just made the scoop rectangular, took the Cessna 172 again at 3,000 feet, and it turns out it's, the height here is 18 feet. It's considerably higher than the ceiling here. In fact, since it's elliptical, it's really much higher in the center. That's why biplanes are so inefficient. The upper wing, uh, the lower wing is drawing a, a vacuum on the upper wing. So if you look at modern biplanes, they push the upper wing forward or at least put the root forward to get it out of the suction of the lower wing. Okay, before we go on, one second of review. We know that lift is proportional to the amount of air diverted times the vertical velocity. That's just Newton's second law. The amount of air diverted is proportional to the speed and density. That's the scoop. The vertical velocity is proportional to the angle of attack and the speed. And from that, we'll be able to calculate everything. Now you'll be, it's, we'll start flying, and you get to see the power of this. What happens if you increase the speed? If you double the speed, you double the amount of air diverted by the scoop. And since the load has an increase, you have to decrease the, you have to have the vertical velocity so they have the same lift. So the faster you go, the smaller the angle of attack. That's how the plane adjusts for speed. If you go higher in altitude, you divert less, it's less density, you divert less air, and therefore you have to increase the vertical velocity. So the higher you go for the same speed, the higher the angle of attack to maintain the constant lift. Now here's something else that um, we introduced. You read a book like Anderson's Introduction to Flight, their power isn't even mentioned in the index. They, would, they only discuss things like drag, which can't be derived. It's just handed down from above. Power is easy, and drag can be derived trivially from it. There are two powers associated with flight. There's induced power, which is the rate energy is given to the air to maintain the lift. And there's parasitic power. That's just the power loss of dragging the antennas and the wheel struts and all through the air. And then the total power is just the sum of the two. Induced power comes from kinetic energy, which is one-half mv squared. If you have a bullet of mass m going at speed v, its kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. So induced power is proportional to the amount of air diverted down, the mass, times the vertical velocity squared. But we already know that the lift is proportional to the amount of air diverted down per time times the vertical velocity. So the induced power is just proportional to the lift times the vertical velocity. So what happens if we double the speed of the airplane? If we double the speed of the airplane, we divert twice as much air, and therefore we have to decrease the vertical velocity by a factor of two to give us the same lift. But we know that the induced power goes as the vertical velocity. So you double the speed, you have the vertical velocity. The induced power is proportional one over speed. And this is the backside of the power curve. It's that simple. It just, it just falls out when you understand. Parasitic power is also easy to understand how it goes. When uh, the plane hits a molecule, it gets an energy one-half mv squared, so it's speed squared. And the rate it hits molecules is proportional to speed. You go twice as fast, you hit twice as many molecules. So it's the parasitic power goes as the speed cubed. And you get the parasitic power curve. Add the two, and you get the power curve of an airplane. That's that's the power it takes to fly as a function of speed, which just falls out once you understand how a wing flies, which is absolutely inaccessible from the old explanation. What's interesting here is when you're flying on the back side of the power curve, as it's called, the slower you go, the less air you divert, the greater your angle of attack, the higher the vertical velocity, the higher induced power, and it takes more and more power to go slower and slower until finally you're looking up into the sky and you can't stay up anymore at full power. That's the backside. It crews, you're dominated by, by the parasitic power, which goes as a speed cubed. So it, you come to the stops very quickly. Now if you increase, it, you put the big bucks into the big engine, you find you can climb a lot faster, but you don't go any faster, hardly. You have to increase the, speed, the power of the engine by a factor of eight to get a factor of two in power. So that's why you work on the drag, not on uh, 
on the power. So how does altitude affect power? Just to s now that we understand power, you go higher, the scoop diverts less air, so you have to go to a higher angle of attack, so that means a higher vertical velocity, and we know that, that um, induced power goes as a vertical, is proportional to vertical velocity, so when you're flying slow, the higher you go, the more power it takes to stay in the air. For um, crews where you're dominated by parasitic power, you, do, you hit less molecules, so you can go faster or it takes less power. So th when you go high, you can, it's, ch it takes less power for crews, but more power to fly slow. Part of every pilot's vocabulary is drag. And this is all the farther aeronautical engineers get. It's these, they have these two plaques, and one of them is, you know, has handed down drag from God, and it's written in there. It's, you can't derive it. But in fact, drag is just power divided by speed, or power is just drag times speed. So we already have the answer. We know that induced power goes as 1 over speed, so induced drag goes as 1 over speed squared. So this is the induced drag. Parasitic power goes as speed cubed. Parasitic drag goes as speed squared. And this is, this is the drag curve. Which should, once you understand power, it just falls out. But as I say, they don't even have power in the index of these books. I, sh I should point out that when a pilot, especially one that has a propeller, says drag, he probably means power. When, when you're flying at full power, if you had an airplane that had two meters, one that said power, one that says drag, you fly at full speed, full power, and now you lower the landing gear, the plane slows down. But if you looked at those meters again, you'd find the power meter still says the same power reading, but the drag curve is in fact higher. So your speed wasn't limited by your power, I mean by your drag, it was limited by the power. Because a value of power at one speed means something very different at another speed. Effective load on uh, stall speed. The st uh, wing stalls at a specific angle, independent of the load. And so what happens is, if you increase the load, I, I double the load, I now have to divert, I'm not going any faster, I'm not diverting any more air, but I have to double the vertical velocity, and so I go to d twice the angle of attack. And so if you plot the angle of attack, it, um, the angle of attack is a function of speed. This is for straight and level, this is for 2G turn. Here's the stall angle of attack. You see that straight and level, it stalls at 40 miles an hour. At 2G turn, it's stalling at almost 60 miles an hour. You, and if you go higher, you st already, you're diverting less air, you go to, have to go to a higher angle of attack. You can always find an angle of attack where you stall. It's just by giving it enough load. As you, the load increases, the angle of attack increases until you finally hit the stall. And that's what it means you can stall at any speed. Okay, effective loading on power. Um, what happens if you double the load on the, on the wing? You're not going any faster. You have to double the angle of attack. We know that the vertical velocity is proportional. And we have to double the vertical velocity. But the power is proportional to load times the vertical velocity. We've doubled the load. We've doubled the vertical velocity. That means the power's gone up by a factor of four. So the induced power goes as the load squared. So that just falls out. These are the, shows you that the basic uh, relationships in aeronautics just fall out when you understand. And that's why the big 747s worry about those little holes in the seats and everything. It's the load squared that they have to pay for. So what affects, okay, in fact, this is just data for a, seven, a 777. And in fact, I fitted this. This is for a constant speed, constant altitude, but changing load. And it fits just right. You get a, 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 a velocity. And this, oh, this is uh, relative fuel flow. This is thousands, this is thousands of pounds per uh, hour. So what you find is that you get a constant, which is the parasitic drag. You get one that goes as the load squared. And then there's a small term, just the fact that changing the angle of attack causes the fuselage to drag a little more. So what affects wing efficiency? Let's take a, a plane, fixed speed, fixed um, load, and double the area of the wing. The scoop is twice as big. It's diverting twice as much air. Therefore, I go to half the vertical velocity. I go to half the power. So the larger the wing, the less power it takes to develop the same lift. It's, 
It's that simple. There's a type of airplane called a canard, which is French for duck. Um, a typical airplane, the horizontal stabilizer, the, the, the tail wing, people think is holding the tail up, and in fact it's pulling the tail down. And for a Cessna, that could be 10% of the weight of the airplane, pulling it down. It's a, it's a stability and balance thing. So in fact, the load on the wing is, can be 200 pounds higher than the weight of the airplane. And since the power requirement is the load squared, this is a, a significant load penalty. So people think that canards with uh, stabilizers in front, now in this case, all horizontal surfaces are lifting. And they say, ah, that must be very efficient. And so they're sold as efficient airplanes, but they're not. The problem is, for safety reasons, the canard has to stall first, so they put a large load on this. That little wing can be holding up as much of a, as a third of the airplane. So what you're doing is you're doing a lot of work with a small wing, but we, we saw that the larger the wing, the more efficient it is. So in fact, you're doing too much work with too small of a wing, so they're actually inefficient, even though they look very efficient. I seem to have missed a trans... I have to go back, yeah. In physical terms, in physics terms, with this efficiency, what you want to do is you want to maximize the momentum transfer, since the momentum transfer is the force, the lift. So that's mv. And you want to minimize the kinetic energy, which is mv squared. So what that means is you want to divert, you want to make m large and v small. Ideally, the wing wants to divert lots of air at a very low velocity. This explains why gliders are very efficient. They have huge wings for their weight. So they divert lots of air at a very low velocity. That's very efficient. Helicopters are very inefficient because they have small wings, even though they're going fast, which compensates some. They're diverting a small amount of air at a very high velocity. And that's why you can't hang on your propeller, even though you've got a 250 horsepower engine on it. That propeller's diverting too much air, too, high of a too little air at too high of a velocity to produce the thrust you need to hold your plane up. It's also why fan jets look the way they do. If you look at, if you look at the jet on a 777, you'll find that the diameter is within a few inches of the diameter of the fuselage on a 737. You could put six seats in an aisle in that. <laughs> they'd be very uncomfortable. <laughs> but in fact, it's a propeller. In front, you have a big fan that's blowing air. It's being driven by, the, it's being driven by a jet. The flames come out here. But the bypass ratio, which is the amount of air that bypasses and just gets blown out cold compared to the air that goes through the firebox, is typically 8 to 1. And ideally, you want the exhaust velocity from the jet to be the same as from the fan. You draw power off until the two match. So in that jet, 11% um, of the thrust is produced by the jet, and the rest is produced by a great big propeller. And it's doing exactly the, what you want to do. It's producing lot. It's it's diverting a lot of mass at a very low velocity to develop the same thrust. Okay, there's, um, there's one thing that's uh, not known by the, you know, air, uh, by the aeronautics community, and I'll explain why. Remember, in the beginning here, for the upwash, the air turns up. Newton's first law says that requires a force which is up, and Newton's third law says that requires a force on the wing that's down. That upwash is a load on the wing. And it's, it's fairly easy to, to find out what that is. It's proportional, to, it's proportional to the weight times 2 over the aspect ratio. The aspect ratio is the span of the wing, tip to tip, divided by the mean cord. And a typical number for a typical small plane is like 8. So that means that there is a load here of about an additional 25%. And we'll, we'll see later that that's important for understanding things like ground wash, down, uh, ground effect. So here, this glider, you'll see, has an extreme aspect ratio. This is to remove that power loading. It also has a narrow wing, which gives you laminar flow, which I won't go into. This is an extremely effective airplane. This has a uh, glide ratio of 60 to 1, which means it can e extract enough energy dropping one foot to glide 60. Wing vortices is another um, branch that, or another topic where there's a lot of confusion, particularly among pilots and aeronautical engineers. The lift on a wing, this, the lift on a wing is 
it looks very much like that ellipse that I uh, drew for the for the scoop. In this case, this is a, a jet with a, in a high-speed maneuver. It's broken in the center because of the big uh, fuselage, but basically this condensation maps out the load on the wing. It's very high near the root, and it tapers to zero at the tip. It's basically a boundary value problem. It has to go to zero at the tip, since at the tip, the high pressure at the bottom communicates around the end to the top. So you have a, a variation in load, and this this gives you a variation in downwash velocity and also height of the air with a, with a velocity. So at the root, it takes air from very high above, and as it goes to the tip, it gets less and less. Just like in the Kawanda effect, two, air, two, air, uh, or two streamlines with different velocities curve toward the slow air. This does exactly the same thing. At the root, you have much higher velocity, and it tapers out to the end. And so what happens is the air comes off in a big sheet. That's what the downwash sheet is what's giving you the lift, and it curls out toward the tip because of the, the gradient and lift. The tightness of the curling depends on how fast the lift is changing with, uh, with position along the wing. At the tip, it comes to a, uh, it has the highest gradient because it has to go to zero very quickly. So you get this wingtip vortex, which is all in, most people know about. In fact, even though it's often the most visible, it has, it has a very small amount of the energy. If you look here, you see the downwash sheet, down, uh, the wing vortex has made a nice, smooth, deep hole, and that the, down, that the wingtip vortex is just a nice little spiral at the end. Now, we've all seen, um, well, we've all seen winglets on the end of planes. It's these little vertical wings, and most pilots think that that increases the efficiency of the wing by reducing the wingtip vortex. In fact, it strengthens the wingtip vortex because what it does is it blocks the communication around the end. So now the lift can go out farther along the wing, and we know a larger wing is more efficient, therefore the wing is more efficient, but now it's got a very sharp gradient at the end, so you get a much stronger wingtip vortex. In fact, you can't put winglets on existing wings with one exception because the wings aren't designed to have the load extend out so far. The only exception was on the 737 when Boeing made it into a corporate jet. They said, you will have winglets in it, and they got special dispensation because they're not going to fly them very much. But in fact, <laughs> you, you'd get the same effect if you took those winglets and laid them flat. Okay. The real reason they're usually put on, in all honesty, is that they're sexy. They're really, they're really not worth the trouble. But in fact, it's not always at the tip. Here is a nice picture of flat vortices. Here, the, this plane's coming in for a landing. The greatest gradient is at the end of the flap, and now you see the nice vortices. It's not at the tip at all. There's a lot of mythology having to do with wingtip vortices. Most of it is just mythology. Circulation. Um, I won't get into, there, there's maybe a few out there that think, ah, I know what causes lift. It's circulation. Air goes around. And you, you can't describe lift without circulation, and its wing flies with bound vortices and everything. First, you can dismiss that by first you have to give me a reason, for, a driving force for the bound vortice. But secondly, think of a wing going at the speed of sound. No information can transfer forward. You can't have this nice circular bound vortex around the wing because no information can go forward, yet the physics of, of flight doesn't change at the speed of sound. So, but anyway, this is... We're back to the person standing on the mountaintop. He has a camera. He takes a picture right around the wing of the velocity distributions. As the air above the wing, has, we have a lower pressure, which draws air in to accelerate. It accelerates the air. The acceleration of the air is, is a product of the lowering of the pressure, not the cause of it. The air is incompressible. And therefore, the volume has to be maintained. So you're sucking in air. It sucks it from below where the pressure is higher. And that's the cause of the upwash. But what you'll notice that right underneath the wing, there's almost nothing happening. It doesn't really communicate all the way through. It's almost nothing happening. Back here, the air's going straight down. So because of that, you can hang anything you want on the bottom of the wing, and it doesn't interfere with, uh, with the lift. Of course, they infer power. I mean, so they hang bombs and tanks and rockets and stuff 
On the other hand, it'd be real hard to top, drop a bomb from the top of the wing. <laughs> but, so you can hang anything you want on the bottom of the wing, but you have to leave the top clear. That's why it's very common to see struts on high-winged airplanes, but historically very rare to see struts on low-winged airplanes because the strut interferes with the lift. We're getting there. Ground effect, another bit of mythology. Even the FAA believes that ground effect, well, first let me explain what ground effect is. As a plane comes into land, as it gets within a wing length of the ground, it finds that the wings become much more efficient. The closer it gets to the ground, the more and more efficient they are until it can fly. In fact, if you're going too fast, you can't even get on the ground because of ground effect because you become so efficient that you can fly at almost any angle. This, when you see geese or swans flying just across a lake, they're flying in ground effect. At the energy they're putting out, they would not be able to fly, say, six feet above the water. What's happening, well, what the FAA thing is happening and most pilot things is happening is that air is piling up between the wing and uh, the ground and that you're essentially becoming a hovercraft. It's not true. You saw that the upwash is a load. So when you're flying, if you have an aspect ratio of 8, this is about a 25% increase in load. But the power is proportional to the load squared, so that means it's about an 50% increase in the power, induced power for lift. And when you're landing and taking off, you're dominated by induced power. So it takes much more power to fly slow with a, when you're out of ground effect. But what happens when you get near the ground is that the ground blocks the, the circulation underneath the wing. It, the air is still made up, but it doesn't come underneath the wing. And so now the air comes much more horizontally. You don't have to suck it up from below. And the wing becomes much more efficient. It takes less power. You go to a smaller angle of attack, smaller vertical velocity, and you can fly in a much lower power setting. So for taking off from uh, soft fields, grass, or sand or something, pilots will get, come up, to, they'll lift their wheels just out of the sand or grass as soon as they can, and they accelerate along, at a, they're flying, but they couldn't fly, say, 10 feet above that. And when they get fast enough, they lift out. OK, now I'm going to give you the one paragraph. I'm going to teach you the Bernou part of Bernoulli that we were never taught. They always stopped kind of one paragraph short in the book. What we were taught is that the Bernoulli equation, which is the pressure, times one-half rho v squared. There's another term, um, rho gh, a potential term, which is, is insignificant with air and is thrown out by aeronautical engineers since there's no mass, basically, and the heights are small. So we have pressure plus one-half rho v squared is a constant in a pipe. What that means is, of course, we never really define, or most people don't define this pressure. It's the static pressure. So at point A, where the pipe is big, the flow is small, the static pressure is high. As it constricts down, it speeds up. At point B, the, the air is going fast, and therefore the static pressure is low, and this is a venturi in a carburetor. Actually, the pressure is static pressure, which is measured perpendicular to the flow. You know that where it's going faster, if you were stuck your finger in there, you certainly would feel a higher pressure. It doesn't, that's fine. That's what we were taught, and that's where it stops in our, most of our education. When I was flying, the thing that bothered me is on the side of the airplane, there's a static port, which is a little hole. And the altimeter reads the pressure off of that. And the altimeter is extremely sensitive pressure um, gauge. It'll measure the difference in a few feet. You start your engine, you run it up. And while you're doing your run up, the air's probably going 100 miles an hour across that static port. And you look at the altimeter, and it hasn't changed an inch. It's just fixed. Yet the air's going 100 miles an hour across that port. And it's completely contrary to the way I looked at it. Aeronautical engineers understand this a little better. They, they just take, they say that the pressure plus one-half rho v squared, this term they call the dynamic pressure, is just equal to the total pressure. If you look at this fan, the fan is increasing the pressure, the dynamic pressure, but it's not increasing the static pressure. It's not confined. And even if it were, conf were, even if it were increasing the static pressure, it's not confined, so the air would just accelerate. It would just expand out. 
or you know, if it's if it's decreasing, it would just com collapse. It's not confined, so the, you cannot support any pressure difference. So just because air is moving faster doesn't mean that it has a lower static pressure. In fact, if it's not confined, it only has a lower static pressure if it's bending. So let's look at some of the mythology of or misapplications of the Bernoulli. One of them is called the Bernoulli strip, often shown for demonstration of lift on a wing. It's a little strip of paper. You blow across the top, it comes up. And the argument is, my breath has a velocity, therefore the static pressure is lower, and it pulls it up, and we have a demonstration of lift on a wing. My breath does not have lower static pressure. In fact, since I've got pressure in my mouth, it's probably got a higher static pressure until it expands when it comes out. What's happening? Kawanda effect causes it to track along the bent air. Newton's first law says that requires a force. Newton's third law says it puts a force on the paper and pulls it up. It has nothing to do with Bernoulli. The ping pong ball in the air from a dryer. It's um, confined. The same argument. The static pressure is lower in the air from the, the dryer. When the ball gets to the edge, it's pushed in by the higher static pressure of the still air. But in fact, it's not. The static pressure in the air from the dryer is exactly the same as the air next to it. It's just like a propeller. What's happening is when you get to the edge, you get an asymmetric flow. You get a you know, momentum transfer. You get a force, and it's pulled back in. Nothing to do with Bernoulli. Same thing, two ping pong balls on, a, on two strings. You blow between them. They come together. It's momentum transfer and not uh, Bernoulli. And for the final one, the curve ball, which if you look at a, a, a ball traveling, the ball in this case is traveling from left to right. They're not spinning, just flows uniformly around it. Now let's put a spin on the ball, in this case over the top. If it has stitching or cuts put in there by the pitcher, it drags air around with it. Now we put the two together and what you find is that over the top where the air being dragged around goes into the apparent airflow from the move, you know, from the moving air, or the apparent airflow, they're opposed. It slows it down, robs energy from that airflow, and causes it to stall early. So it can't track around the ball as far. On the bottom side, where the boundary layer that's being pulled around is in, in the same direction as the airflow, it now has more energy, it can wrap farther around the ball before it stalls. And what you do is you get an asymmetric stall. You get asymmetric airflow. Air, in this case, is diverted up, puts a force down on the ball, and that's the curve ball. Again, nothing to do with Bernoulli. And I'll end the talk there. Thank you very much.